Sierra Echo knowing that his aircraft is capable of getting back to the safe side of the missed approach, you know, quickly, it is super critical in making that decision. Ready. This is Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk. Your host, Alpha Golf and Romeo Hotel, have a half century of aviation experience in combat helicopters, airliners, and air traffic control. They answer your questions about flying, aviation, and ATC. This weekly podcast is for entertainment and education and does not serve as a replacement for a qualified flight instructor, an examiner, the FARs, the 7110, your best friend, your next pilot, or your cat. November 628 Charlie Delta Squawk 1200, frequency change approved. The audio will be available on live ATC. Good day. November 643 Juliet Mike, clear visual approach from way 23 left, Connect Tower. November 3222 Yankee, area of heavy to extreme precipitation, 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock, 15 miles, 7 miles. Uh, 3047 Charlie, try a departure, radar contact, climb and maintain. November 747 Sierra Lima, reduce speed to 180, you're overtaking traffic ahead on final. Skyhawk 77 Tango, IFR cancellation received, squawk VFR, frequency change approved. Sierra 720 yeah. Fox, yeah. Trent Alpha, yeah. flatting yeah. 190 vectors for the visual Skyhawk approach. Skyhawk Niner, Runway, Sierra two, Papa, clear to enter triad class Charlie surface area from the east, maintain special VFR conditions. Please welcome retired Army pilot Alpha Golf and the rookie first officer at Penguin Airlines, Romeo Hotel. And it's Monday, March 4th, 2024, episode 322. On today's show, we'll talk about late missed approaches and more of your awesome feedback. What's up, AJ? Hello, hello, everyone. Happy Monday. Yes. You're working today? I am. Mm, I'm not. I'm home. I'm not working for three days. Hmm. Three days. Mm hmm. Three day weekend. I don't mm. think it was because of the way that I bid. I think I just got what's left because I'm like literally the most junior person available this month. Mm -hmm. but you can kind of say hey i want to do two days between groups or three days i put three and i got that most of the time this week or this month Might as well yeah ask for the moon i well that's really not the moon the moon is the fantasy land i'm in right now with picking oh, trips right. <laughs> <laughs> i did get my next trip it wasn't my first choice so they were taken or something was happening with these other trips that i couldn't have them one of them was hidden. I tried to get a trip that was in the bid packet, but it wasn't presented as an even out there. It's like, it's totally top secret now. Mm. I'm like, well, I still don't know the number. I'm going to ask for it. I didn't get it. <laughs> mm. They're like, how did you know about this? Have I explained this on the show well enough yet to, to what's happening right now with my hours? I don't think so. I don't know. I've answered this question with family and they've answered, asked and answered so many times. I'm confused on who I've told, but... So, when you're done with OE, which I'm done with, mm -hmm. the last little hoop you have to jump through, if you will, is consolidation. You, in 120 days, you have to get 100 hours in the airframe. Z frame z. If right. you don't, it has implications. You have to go back to training land and jump through 40 hoops. I don't want to jump through those hoops again. Nobody wants to do that. It's, it's done. Don't do that. Just get your time. Right. Well, years ago, they used to leave it to chance. All right, you're on reserve, you're junior, you're going to get used, you'll get your time. That didn't always work. And there were a lot of people that had to go back and redo all those things and then start their 100 hours over again. Because mm. there's no way to get past that. The FAA will not allow that to be dismissed. It really? must happen. Okay. So now they say, hey, send us your request and we'll we'll give you the trips that fit into your little three, four, five, six day blocks, find stuff that fits, put it in a list in this format and we'll give you what you, what you need and you'll get your time. So I've been doing that first mm. trip. I got my first request, second trip, first request, Thanks. third, third one that starts on Thursday. I got my fourth request, but I'm still happy. It's a new city and I get to go somewhere new again. Cool. I get to cross the Atlantic again. Wow. I'm getting better at that, too, so. That's good. You uh, don't want to be bad at that. 
Mm -mm. No, being bad at crossing the Atlantic could be really bad. <laughs> it could be. Yeah. The good news is there's other there's two other pilots up there to kind of make sure you don't do anything stupid. Mm. And the list of things we have to do to make it happen legally. Ugh. I know. Things gotta get ruined with some sort of checklist. Exhausting safety and <laughs> procedures. Safety, navigation, and non-radar land. What could go wrong? Oh man, that is a. I, I could do a whole series on ocean navigation and how it's done. I, I'm learning it, but there's interesting things I think people would find interesting on it. But we're not celestial. Being... Are you using no. the stars? No. No. Oh. No. Every day they draw out these tracks that go east and west and they're based on weather and winds and i don't know who the they is the track builders i don't know who they are mm -hmm. and then they put us on one they file us on one of these alphanumeric tracks okay and that's what we do and we have to verify that the track is because it's fabricated every day it's it's not like a, a q route or a victor airway mm -hmm. it's it's a new point to point every day dynamic yeah, and they all run parallel. So if you get on the wrong one, you could see how that could go poorly. Mm. <laughs> I could see that. Mm. What have you been up to? Mm. Oh, I did a little fishing yesterday. Mm. And I did a little rock climbing the day before that. Mm, so your body's hurting and telling you what's going on. Yep, I slept very well. <laughs> uh you know, I have been fishing that long and I haven't been, it's not like I have all this experience mm -hmm. standing in moving water, which is tricky, mm -hmm. especially once you start like trying to relocate from one place to another. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I slipped a couple times. I didn't go in. I didn't completely go in, but you could see like, as you get older, how your balance and everything, like, eh, you might want to have something to hang on to, like a. Some kind of a stick or... Okay, let's let's talk worst case scenario. What's your escape maneuver here for you're submerged, the waders have filled up with water? Nope, what do, that doesn't what do you, happen. What do you do? I, one, I wear a belt that goes around my waist up high to cinch mm. off the waders. Okay, so that so can't this, happen. It's, it would take forever for okay. them to fill up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> um... Let's say that they did, though. Worst case. Now the, you're the little full of water. breaks. You're full of water. Yes. At least now you're neutrally buoyant. I mean. <laughs> right. So are fish submerged in the water. Right. None of these streams, <laughs> though, that I fish in are particularly deep. I mean, there are places that are deep, mm. but it's okay. not that deep. And you couldn't, you wouldn't go like, but... 50 feet down the river you're gonna hit a person <laughs> just someone over there <laughs> okay and you would say hey <laughs> i'm sinking <laughs> and they would say what are you thinking about <laughs> oh that was perfect okay oh. anyway yeah you gotta be careful uh, i went with a guy from work uh it was a good time mm. we got very charlie? early yeah very early pa papa charlie Papa Charlie, yep. Nice. Very nice. Yeah, it was fun. Uh, just good to get outside and uh, stand in cold water for four hours. Mm. I was Which thinking... the waiters keep you dry, but they don't keep you warm. <laughs> right. I could not feel my legs from the knees down. You got to go get those uh, like little boot warmer things. The pads that have some sort of... I don't know what they are. I don't. There's some sort of chemical in them, but they're for skiing. Can you put those in your waiters? Mm. You know what I I'm guess talking you about? Could put them down. I don't know. There's not a lot of room in there. Neoprene, <laughs> like <laughs> neoprene boots. I don't. Know. Maybe I don't know. Shall we begin? Probably. All right. Ready. Since OB three twenty one, we have another. What is happening? We have another ton of patrons. There's a ton. We New patrons. In the show listeners here are Whiskey Romeo, Charlie Golf, Echo Sierra, Charlie Mike, Delta Alpha, Juliet Charlie, Sierra Echo, Mike Papa, Romeo Hotel, and Echo Papa. In the show supporters here, Victor Victor, Juliet Delta, 
Juliet Bravo, Echo Golf, Tango Charlie, Charlie Kilo, Charlie Charlie, and Sierra Echo up from the show listeners here. And we have two new Supreme Galactic Aviation Commanders, Kilo Whiskey and Bravo Foxtrot. We also got our monthly drops from Golf Mike Square. Thank you, everybody, for joining us, taking the time to sign up on Patreon. Something is of value to you that you're going to look for right now, I suppose. <laughs> if you'd like to learn more about supporting the show and seeing our wonderful looking faces on YouTube each week when we record, check out patreon.com slash opposing bases. If you haven't done so already, hit subscribe or the follow button on your podcast player and leave us a review and only five star ratings. Must be five. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Reviews and announcements. Reviews and announcements. All right, for those of you watching the live version, I am playing the audio still. If you stop going over to the audio version because you see it live, that's fine. But you're, those little pauses that seem awkward, there's really no way for us to do this with our new setup that makes any sort of sense. So the audio is happening in the background. Yeah. This is the most efficient way. It is. It's, this is our best setup we've had, in a, I think, in our time. This is the way. This is... <laughs> This is the way. Do you want the review? <laughs> sure. <laughs> the review. Confessions of a Serial Moocher. Speaking of... <laughs> speaking of Patreon. And uh, PayPal, which... Uh, you PayPalers, thank you. Mm -hmm. Some of you are very... Uh, consistent. Yes. Yeah. All right. Confessions of a Serial Moocher. Please forgive me, aviation fathers, for I have sinned. I have enjoyed opposing bases for well over a year now. Uh, I've yet to become a patron. A patron. <clears throat> I have said 50 hail FARs and <laughs> paid my penance via PayPal. This show, hands down, is the best, a.k.a. most entertaining aka informative aviation show in the podcast space i am slowly at least two episodes a day wow working my way through the catalog i have gained valuable knowledge through listening to the podcast and i'm no longer intimidated to ask or question atc the hosts have brought a common sense approach to the faa regulations and a peek behind the curtains at the mythical world of the triad which i'm guessing is nestled between narnia and the lost city of atlantis <laughs> it's just just south of there uh, thank you again for the informative podcast, Alpha Tank. Great thank review. You. Well done. I, I love it. Thank you for taking the time to do that on your, probably your phone, maybe your iPad, tapping away on the keyboard. That took a minute. So thank you for doing that. Mm -hmm. They help get visibility on the show somehow. The people say that doesn't matter, but it does to us. So thank you. It does. And we have fun reading them. We do. We can't read all of them. There's been a lot lately. So there if we didn't get yours, it doesn't mean it wasn't an awesome review. We still think it was awesome. We just haven't gotten all of them. So, yeah. Uh, the announcements. The announcements. Patron Bravo Kilo from the frozen north of Sweden across the pond worked his, in, his first intercontinental arrival, and it was a doozy. Com failure too fast, too fast. <laughs> no, too high, too fast. Turns to get down. <laughs> Cats and dogs. <laughs> Is this a controller? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah, they said they were from a, a smaller airport. Mm. Way in the frozen north. I don't know if you've looked at how far north Sweden is. Mm, it's far. It is way up there. It's cold up there. <laughs> I want to go there. It's warm outside here right now. Okay. Today here where we it are, is. it's very warm. It's very warm. It's probably not warm as in Sweden. Mm. No. All right, that's all we have for announcements. We do not have a Charlie Alpha segment this week. We did an awesome one last week. If you haven't heard that episode, go check it out. Mm -hmm. All right. More music's playing. Music. Timely feedback. Timely feedback. All right, a quick note. Uh, there was a feedback that I meant to put in here. I totally missed it from Sierra Delta. It was on uh, staying sharp in aviation. I am putting that in next week's folder. 
Mm-hmm. So I'm sorry. I don't know how I how I missed it, but I did. So. All right, we got. We got. I love your notes. We got to keep a reasonable pace here. You want me to get number one? Yes. All right, from patron Delta Mike, hello, AGNRH. First, congrats on the new Skype rating and OE completion, RH. Thank you. Learning more every day in this airplane. Got to fly the 400 again. Feeling pretty mm. terrible about my landings. That whole, that, that whole confidence thing that I built up on the first two landings I had in that plane. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Since Cr- been... <laughs> crushed down. Aviation is so good at that. <laughs> crushed. Really I didn't break any dishes. <laughs> but... Uh-huh. Anyway. Uh, is that a thing? <laughs> uh, I think so. <laughs> oh, man. A buddy of mine dropped the oxygen mask he hit so hard. Oh. You know the ones that you see in the safety demonstration? Yeah, yeah. Those little doors came down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm uh-huh. sure someone didn't think that was funny, but... I guess probably not, but at least at that point, there's really no... Um, guessing as to where you are you are on planet earth <laughs> nothing else could cause <laughs> but hold on you're, you're the guy that was sleeping the whole way yeah and that's your wake-up calls waking Boom. up to this just have, have you ever heard the term rubber jungle it's yes <laughs> now there's a button that we could accidentally hit yes. in our pre-flight that will put all these out of their containers that is a delay you oh, are delayed. It's a, oh, it's a delay. It takes a lot of people a lot of time yes. to shove them all back up there. Uh-huh. Get them all. <laughs> Even in the King Air, it was like, oh, my gosh. That's an hour. We're <laughs> an hour. <laughs> Why are you leaving? Because I'm going to get food. There's no way this is going to be fast. <laughs> all right. Sorry. I interrupted the feedback. Okay. Yep. Regarding airspace design, a few years ago, NorCal went on a road trip to a local pilot group to present the new sourdough airspace redesign. The old design was the classic upside down wedding cake, and the new design is a patchwork of polygons. That sounds like a show title. The NorCal presenter called it a St. Bernard. Look at the current airspace. Once you see the St. Bernard, you can never unsee it. Oh, like the shape of a big dog? Oh, huh, it's I, I guess a constellation, so. I guess. Uh, one factor you hadn't <laughs> mentioned was nav aids. The presenter said that the new polygon design was possible due to the prevalence of GPS. The old design's concentric circles were based on DME from the San Francisco VOR DME. That was the only way back in the day to de- uh, to definitively identify the boundaries of the inner and outer rings. That Perfect. makes total sense. We didn't even think of that yeah. last. Because we're stupid. And we are. This is fantastic. <laughs> There was some negative feedback because not all aircraft, such as the original Piper Cubs, are equipped with GPS, but the foreflight and other portable GPS units are perfectly legal for VFR navigation. Delta Mike. Well, those same Cubs didn't have VORs likely either or any sort of Nothing. navigational aid. So um, quickly, I'll comment on this. That's good. I think it's really cool they came out and presented it to locals that are using the airspace. And... Despite any efforts on either side, no one is going to be able to successfully make everybody happy. There's always going to be somebody that's upset in these changes. This is this makes it harder for me to get into this airport. Or this is too confusing. Or how are we supposed to stay away from this airspace? I get it, but we can't just keep using these circles forever. So how did you know? How did the Piper Cubs do that? Before, when there were just lines on a map, right? Right. And they didn't have DME or anything. What did they do? They looked at a map. Oh, there's a landmark. Hey, I Mm -hmm. might have to build in a buffer because I don't see a suitable landmark. You know, Mm -hmm. that it lies exactly on the line. So we're going to have to come out a little bit. There's a lake. There's the thing. You can't go past that. You can't go past this. Mm -hmm. Old school pilotage. Yep. If you don't have a GPS and that's the way you have to do it, that's the way you have to do it. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, sorry. Thank you, Delta Mike. And thank you, NorCal, for going out and <coughs> talking about the St. Bernard with the local pilots. That's right. that's cool. That shows they care. That's number right. two. Number, number two, two. I don't know why, but all of this font is now very small. I don't know either. I've done this. It is my fault, I'm sure. All right. All right, number two from Patreon Tango Charlie was listening on audio and caught familiar taxi instructions. Uh, the big tree delta, I guess, is that what we're calling it? Uh, no. I don't remember that name, but sure. Oh, that is near there. Oh, he leaves a link. I didn't put that in the show notes. 
I'll go do that now. Okay, the taxi instructions at an hour and seven minutes and 20 seconds. Sounds crazy, but it's so standard that most of us can do it in our sleep after a, a couple dozen flights. There's indeed a ton of parking. So that's all you need. If you're a visitor, you have no hope of understanding what in the world is happening. There's indeed a ton of parking, but the airport does about 500 flights a day and is a major GA training airport. It has something like 300 planes based there and several flying clubs. Mm. Uh, That diagram you looked at is also pretty new. They finished a revamp of the whole parking design just a few years ago. Uh, It's a great is the airport is great to fly out of for many reasons but honestly the best may be that its controls are absolutely top notch one sunny day last year while working on my private pilot's license my instructor and i were something like number six in the pattern with a few planes waiting to take off wow on a short runway it's 2400 feet dang we actually looked at each other in amazement as controller working tower at the time was coordinating everything wonderfully while still making traffic call outs to planes just outside her airspace so major shout out to the big tree delta controllers. Mm-hmm. Cool. Tango Charlie. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, if you missed that, I think we put a link in the show notes last week, but I'll try to make sure I get this in there for this week as well. Number three from patron Victor Victor. I'm a Patreon supporter and regular listener. As a CFII, after your episode OB78, 278 on Lost Comms, I opined, Mm. is that the word, Mm -hmm. that the show should be required listening to all instrument pilots. This week's show, OB321, struck another chord, that of STEM programs. We found, we founded a program called Susquehanna STEM to the skies based in the Penn Valley Airport in southern central Pennsylvania. We're a 501c3 public charity that seeks to introduce the myriad employment opportunities in aviation to middle and high school students career technical center students and a university-based flying club cool yeah so we weren't sure where you'd find these but here's one Uh, we work with scout troops and school field trips to show students what general aviation is and how we need larger numbers of pilots controllers mechanics drone pilots and airport managers in the coming years to meet the significant demand for new employees we introduce students to life flight helicopter pilots Another group of really amazing pilots. And corporate jet pilots. Also kind of okay. (laughs) I'm just kidding. You mentioned stemflights.org in the episode, and we have offered exploratory flights to the high school students who participate in our four-day STEM camps. We also employ a Redbird FMX AATD simulator to allow every student to fly, in quotes, a Cessna 172. We saw those at AirVenture one year. I think that was one on a little movable. It's it's not full motion, but it, it moves a little bit. It's on some sort of rocker, mm. I believe. Um, we are committed to improving STEM education in our schools and believe aviation is the foundation to make this happen. Thanks for all you are doing to improve general aviation safety. All right, if you're interested and you're in that area, Susquehanna STEM to the skies. I do not have a link. But I, I tried to find one, um, okay. but I... I didn't find like a direct link. There's a ton of affiliated mm. places that mention, but I, I didn't find uh, an actual website. But you can find information if you just go look for Susquehanna STEM. Okay. Um, Susquehanna is S U S Q U E H A N N A. So there you go. Cool. Thanks for sharing that, Victor. Victor, and supporting the show. You get number four. Number four from patron Delta Golf. Hello, Sky Gods and OB321. (laughs) You asked for ways in which we, the pilots of the NAS, stay sharp. I know it's easy for us to fall into our routine, always flying the pattern or visiting the same airports repeatedly. Luckily for some of us, we live close to a state that offers a pilot passport program. I found these programs to be wonderful tools for keeping us weekend warriors somewhat sharp. How, you might ask, these programs encourage pilots to fly to airports of various types and sizes from grass strips in the middle of nowhere all the way up to the Beer City Bucky, Badger, or Cheesehead Charlies. (laughs) We have to re-engage the training we received for our private 
uh, but maybe haven't used since our check rides. Cross-country planning, proper radio procedures for non-towered airports, proper radio procedures for Class C and D, short field, soft field, you get the idea. Visiting some of these airports can take a pilot out of his or her comfort zone. We might have to talk to someone at a Tracon. This is very, very dangerous. <laughs> just, it's just use caution. Uh, maybe try to hit the green dot at the busiest airport in the world, or God forbid, call an airport manager to find out the condition of a grass field. Oof. Soggy to quite soggy. Uh, so when I'm tired of smashing bugs under the windy seat of Bravo, I'll cross the cheddar curtain <laughs> to get a $200 stack of pancakes and stamp my passport. I wish every state had a program like this. I've visited airports I'd otherwise ignore just to stamp a silly little book. And in doing so, I've learned more about flying than I could in any ground school. Regards, patron Delta Golf. That's very cool. Um, we, When I flew out of Virginia in the helicopter, the state of Virginia had the same program. And mm -hmm. we had, um, they didn't give every pilot a, a little book, but we had a couple for the company. And we would um we kept a big map and we would pin all the places we had been so if you had a flight that didn't have any specific mission you would go in you would look at the map see where we hadn't been check the little booklet make sure it hadn't been stamped and then you would go plan a flight to that to that place um that's cool yeah and some of them in virginia included the bravos you know into the freeze. Mm. So there was a lot of learning involved in doing that. It's very good. I, I love that technique. Yeah. Um, we should make an OB passport book of some sort. Oh, that would be cool. Like a list of things that can take someone who maybe isn't comfortable with ATC to the point of, no, we got it. We've done all these things. We've got all the check boxes in our book. Mm. We should do that. Hmm. I like that. Let's keep that in mind. All right. No stealing that. Yeah, this we're gonna make it. Don't yeah. don't come out with it, please. Yeah. We said it here. <laughs> Number five from Patron Golf X ray, some short feedback on the third decimal in Europe. Ah. <laughs> now if you're if you're trying to make me mad, you just did. Um all right. Channel spacing is 8.33 kilohertz and 25 in the U.S. Nobody cares. I'm sorry. I Thank you for sending this in. I'm just still sassy about it because it's, <laughs> I, I probably got 99 out of 100 calls this week. I got them. I did it. Yeah. I was, I was trying to follow our own advice. Every call is for you. Well, it's the French. They, I can't understand them. All right, I'm going to read this. I'm sorry. Um, it's more densely populated and frequencies we're running out. Not all channels are 0 .005 apart, but for example, 3455 is how we would say it here. And they would say 134, 134 decimal 550 over there. And 34555 could both exist. Uh, I don't think that's true here, is it? It's not true here. Okay. Those would be the same. At least here in Germany, you can shorten frequencies with the following. 24.100 could be 124.1124.100. Decimal decimal oh, or. He put an or there. Or 124.100. 124.15 has to be 124.150. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if that's true, though. I don't... There's no effect... We can't do anything about that third digit. Not in the U.S., but that's what he's saying. In Europe, they they can. Okay. They can manipulate that because the the banding is shorter. Okay. Now, we yes. we have the third digit. It, you can see it on our, on our panel. Yes, but there's yeah. no reason to say anything because we are in 25 kilohertz spacing... But you're saying over there, the reason they say it is because I am rolling past choices. Yes. Huh. Yep. That's I what might have saying. to take back everything bad I said about it. Oh, that was kind of the point of this <laughs> oh. feedback. <laughs> All right. 
i.e. double zeros at the end can be omitted. Further note, the the above are channels. The actual frequencies used are different, but not visible to the users. Cheers, Golf X-Ray. Okay. I, I want to pause my judgment <laughs> and wait until I... I want to see what happens when I scroll past these choices. Okay. I'm, I'm fine admitting I may be wrong here. Okay. All right. <laughs> I don't know. But, I've never flown there. I don't... I don't know. A buddy of mine complained in the opposite way. They don't get the third digit, or they do, and they can't affect that change because their tuning head doesn't have doesn't that third digit. It. And ours does, so I could totally be wrong here. <laughs> huh. <laughs> ours could definitely... Well, mm, yeah, in the helicopter, you could definitely change it. Now, if you were just using... No, I think you could actually go in and change the spacing the, mm. in the settings of the really? radio. Really? Yeah. Huh. Because you could put any. We had we had one radio that you could put any any numbers, anything, you name it. It could put it. You could put it in there. Okay. It is a multi band everything radio. Hmm. Uh, to any spacing. I mean, so yeah. I, I don't know. I don't remember in the King Air. I know the we had those standard. Um, what is that radio? That compact, you know, with the orange. You are asking the wrong person. It's, K- the, it's the same. Yeah, maybe it's a King. King, yeah, yeah. Those defaulted to you. You couldn't manipulate that if you put in. Mm-hmm. You know, it automatically would add that third digit to whatever it was Mm -hmm. to whatever it was going to be but i will say this look there's no more densely populated frequency land than the Mm. united states especially on the east coast i mean there's overlapping ctaf yeah you're here in ctaf on six different airports at when you're airborne at some places Mm -hmm. like it and we make it work yes we do pretty pretty dense (laughs) it's pretty dense so Thank you, Golf X-Ray. I will pause my complaining about this and do some experimenting with the numbers and see what happens. But thank you. You'll get the last one. All right. Number six from Patron Tango Sierra Gents. For me, the best method of staying sharp is to fly as often as I can. Right. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to go up as frequently as I'd like on a consistent basis for a variety of reasons. So to keep my head in the game when I can't go up, I do a combination of things. Religiously listen to OB each week, of course. It goes without saying. Mm-hmm. Participate daily in a number of online aviation forums. Subscribe to a number of aviation magazines. And finally, I have a Redbird TD2 basic aviation training device, which is a fancy term for an FAA-approved flight sim that's legal for logging off our currency. Wow. Mm, well, that's, that's cool. Ha- that's handy. Very handy to have. Yeah. <laughs> for me, having the BATD at home is a game changer in helping maintain IFR currency and proficiency as it's a huge time saver and doesn't necessitate uh, trying to sync up with a safety pilot. The weather here in Tampa rarely having it a non-convective IMC conducive to logging some actual IFR. Hmm. Okay, so it's either sunny or it's thunderstorms. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe not safe to go flying through clouds in Florida in July, Uh, question mark? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, be careful. As for airspace shape design, I wonder if the predominantly round shape of Bravos and Charlies was a result of the primary nav systems in use pre-GPS and moving map. I think you are right, sir. Yeah. I, uh, or ma'am, I don't know. I think you are right, <clears throat> uh, as discussed previously. Seems to me that the easiest way to define and navigate airspace back in the day would have been a radius off of a central ground-based nav aid, hence the round shape. Huh. You thought of that. We did not take take care, patron. Take a Sierra. Math. Yeah. Circles. Math and stuff. Um, For those of you who don't fly, have never done instrument flying or any flying for that matter, I'll just add this real quick. Private pilot, commercial pilot is a mechanical learning the ins and outs of manipulating the flight controls. Instrument, I would categorize as procedural. And you can get a, a lot of the benefit of instrument training in, an, in an, a device like this that's on top of a desk. 
or mm-hmm. presenting you with what the screens in your airplane would look like without you moving and manipulating the controls. Learning how to use those systems is, and, and seeing what you need to see and navigating using instruments is, is the takeaway of instrument training. So yes. that's why this is so effective. Yes, knowing where the plane needs to go, not necessarily how to make how to yeah, like actually manipulate the controls to make it do that. I would even go as far as saying uh, using automation on an FTD like this is just as valuable as trying to hand fly it. it mm-hmm. Learning how to fly a computer at home is probably going to be negative learning in most cases, unless it's a really high fidelity sim, and that's usually reserved for millions and millions of dollar units that we use, <clears throat> like for airline training. That, for what it's worth, is the airplane. But at home, use the automation. Just get used to what the screens are showing you and what they're presenting. How are you interpreting that information? So, Yep. All right. Fancy jet music. Take it away, AG. Uh, this week's show topic is brought to you by SCAC patron Sierra Echo. Um, let's see. How are we going to do this? Because this is kind of your wheelhouse. I'm happy to read it. Um, I can start and try not. What, how do you think we should tackle this? Because this is complicated. It is complicated. Um, let's just do it uh, bits at a time. Okay. Yep. As we go. Okay. Hello there. I recently had an experience at the little airport near the Big Lake in northern Idaho, familiar to Alpha Golf, that has generated a lot of thoughtful debate among my aircraft type owners club on how to best respond to a particular scenario. I was on a short flight from the busy Delta and the Coffee Bravo to the Big Lake airport. Prior to departure, I confirmed with both a webcam and the FBO that the runway was dry with just a few wispy bits of snow blowing around from a previous snow shower. By the time I was nearing the airport 45 minutes later, the ceiling had lowered and another big snow shower had come and gone. I flew the Arnav Zulu runway 20 into that airport, broke out with enough time to see the runway, but to also notice that there was more snow on the runway than there had been when I departed. I continued the approach, landed, and after determining with a braking test that the 5,400-foot runway was more slippery than published, or I'm sorry, than planned, I performed a rejected landing procedure and went around. The debate then arises as to what should I do next. Should we recap any of this? This is the first time we've been presented with a go-around that occurred after touchdown, I believe, on this show. Yeah, I think so. Yep. Um, But it is. That can happen. It happened. This is a real thing. Yes. Not very common, but this is a real thing. So the alternative was continue sliding down the runway, perhaps go off the runway in a sliding maneuver, damage the airplane and the occupants of said airplane. Right. Or continue with that energy and take off again. They took off. All right. The debate then arises as to what should I do next? Um, Because of the terrain to the south, the Arnav Zulu approach has a missed approach procedure that requires a minimum climb gradient of 318 feet per nautical mile to 4,500 feet with a final missed approach altitude of 6,600 feet. Runway 20 also has an obstacle departure procedure that heads in roughly the same direction with an altitude of 9,000 feet. Aircraft waiting to commence the approach while people like me are flying the approach are held at 8,000 feet at the same fix that serves as the missed approach point. The initial approach fix, the missed approach fix, and the ODP all share the same airspace. All right, you're throwing in. This is making this more complicated. You want to summarize that? Yes, it's super complicated. So, uh, eight thousand. They're holding at eight because the missed approach guys are going to sixty six hundred. So you can't use seven. Right. That's that's no good. No point now. So the next like usable IFR altitude is eight. So that's why they're picking eight. Now, what Mm -hmm. makes this complicated is that. The ODP that that departs from the runway goes to nine. Hmm. Okay, so if the aircraft was holding at ten, this would be like, yeah, just do the ODP and go to nine, right? right. Because 
that's you're definitely safe doing that. But you'd, there could be an airplane holding there. Mm-hmm. However unlikely, you throw in the lost calm idea, and mm-hmm. now this is, you don't even know there's a plane. I guess maybe you see them on ADS-B if you have, if you have some display. But, okay, so that's, that's how this is getting very complicated quickly. There could be someone at eight. You are electing maybe to go to nine because you're not. Anyway, well, he he okay. gets into that a little more. You want me to keep going? Uh, sure. All right. The reason for the debate and something critically important to remember is that once you pass the missed approach point before the runway, the missed approach procedure no longer assures you terrain separation. I'm 99.9% tr- sure that's true. Terp self, if you're listening, I'll repeat it. Once you pass the missed approach point, the missed approach procedure no longer assures you terrain separation. I, I'm... Are you pretty sure that's correct? Yeah, I mean, you know, that makes the, sense. Yeah, it does. It does. I, For ex- I, if you went three miles past the missed approach point, you're at the departure end of the runway now. Right. It's not turf from there. You're in no man's land, right? Right. For example, in this situation, the mandatory climb gradient and lateral course provide terrain separation only if you begin the missed approach procedure one mile before the runway and approximately 400 feet above the runway, and that's the critical difference. You're starting your climb from 400 feet above with a ton of energy. And a versus, mile before. Yes. Versus departing a runway at 35 feet above the departure end, presumably, in this climb gradient requirement of ODP, further away. You're several miles from this point. Terrain is a vector. Um, but my decision to go missed was made when I was already on the runway, well past the missed approach point. So the question is, should I fly the missed approach procedure in this case? Should I fly the obstacle departure procedure in this case? Since this is not really different than a normal takeoff, the aim is clear. It says you should contact ACC right away for new instructions, except Coffee Center, this is the part I was wondering if we'd get to, Mm -hmm. is unreachable. You can't get anybody on the radio until you climb above 7,000 feet because of the hills you're trying to avoid. Because this email is already too long, feel free to cut off here and, and discuss. All right, it is a good talking point. This is a, I think this is a very good question. I don't know that there's a right answer. There's going to be some debate on this. Yeah. I am going to do my best not to take a side in this. Um, <laughs> I, I, feel, I feel inclined to go in one direction. I do like the ODP. However, I would be willing to bet that... M- most pilots are not going to think about the ODP when they're <clears throat> briefing the approach. No. All right. What are your thoughts so far? My thoughts were I felt really good until you know we got to the part where you can't get a hold of ATC. Yeah. Because if you oh. can just get them, like you depart, you switch, hey, we're going missed. Mm-hmm. Uh, the runway sucks. We had to go around short, you know, we're, I mean, we landed or whatever. Uh, and they say, okay, do this or do that. It's done. It's over. All right. That's not available here because now it's over 7,000 until you reach the, until mm-hmm. you reach air traffic. Yeah. This is bad. It's a, and the, in theory, this next plane is holding at eight. So oh, you've no. lost separation before you're able to contact them. Okay. I have a couple it's, ideas and let's we'll keep reading this. this. I have a couple really ideas tough. that I want you to think about while we're going through the rest of this. What if you did the ODP and stopped at the missed approach altitude of 6,600 feet? I don't know that, many, that anybody would think about doing this, but at 6,600 feet, if it's in the same place and I don't have these plates up, Theoretically, that should be giving you adequate and safe margins above the terrain. You may not be able to talk to ATC, but you'll surely be able to reach another airplane on that frequency that is talking to ATC that's above you in the radio band or range yes. of, of ATC. So that's a possibility, right? Hmm. Ooh. I, oh. <laughs> Go. <laughs> well, okay. In theory, that plane is... That's holding. That is the conflict. Mm-hmm. Is talking to air traffic. Yes. Right. 
Okay, so if there is a plane, they're talking air traffic, and you can relay. Yeah. If there's not a plane, then keep climbing. Go to nine. Yeah, keep climbing. Now, this would take a lot of situational awareness for you to know. This is super next level. Yeah, most of the time, ATC is not handing you off to advisories telling you this whole story. Hey, there's somebody here (laughs) at this altitude (laughs) waiting for you to cancel. Maybe you heard that. You could have heard that going in there. Sure. It's common, and this is a busy airport, but let's keep going. Okay. My logic was this. I already know from a prior experience that I have enough power on both two engines and one engine to safely fly the missed approach as published from the runway. Okay. This is what the controller would be expecting. I also know that I don't want to climb to 9,000 on the ODP because of the possibility of holding aircraft at 8,000 in the same airspace. Finally, on a rejected landing in snowy conditions at night, I didn't know this was at night. Now I'm Mm -hmm. terrified. Yeah. I don't want to attempt to reprogram my FMS from the preloaded missed procedure to a VOR green needle CDI slewing obstacle departure procedure. That is too much extra work in a high workload environment. Agree. A hundred percent. This would have to be thoroughly briefed and somehow programmed so that you could do it with some sort of automation, especially if you're single pilot, which I believe you are. This is a lot. It's too much. Yeah, it's too much. I agree. Other people would necessarily have to make a different decision. If their aircraft could not climb steeply enough to clear the hills on the missed approach procedure, the only assuredly safe thing to do would be fly the obstacle departure procedure. Hmm. True. I just don't, I don't give enough credit to people thinking about this. Do, Do you think this is part of their train of thought? Hey, what happens if I get past the missed approach point, touch down and can't stop? What am I going to do? Have you ever thought about this? Well, uh, <clears throat> yeah, but it was on purpose. You know, it, it was intentionally a scenario designed to do this. And then, of course, you're going to have an engine failure. The whole point was, if you go missed, can you climb out of here on one engine? Mm-hmm. You, you need you, to know that. You talked about this in SM, yeah. right? Yes. Yes, you were missed. Uh, you went single engine. In we a were in a maneuver. bad situation, yeah. and we decided, oh, we'll we can circle to the runway, mm-hmm. one engine, and then we went we went in the clouds. We didn't go in the clouds. The, the sim instructor lowered the ceiling into us. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Poof, yeah. We're in, and we're like. Already scud running, you know, Mm -hmm. in this circling approach, single engine. And we said, okay, uh, crap, let's, okay, we'll go miss, start a climb, Mm -hmm. turn towards the airport. We could not climb out of that Mm -hmm. valley, single engine. That was the... Did you die in the sim? Yes. You killed yourselves in the sim. We flew into a mountain. Hmm. So what did you take away from that? When you walked away from that, what could you have done differently? Rewind the scenario. Uh-huh. At what point do you know, hey, we're committed to Earth past this point. What, tell me what your thought is now. Same de- same scenario. You know that's going to happen. What do you do different to avoid that? Um, okay. Our decision point was we are, we're flying. We're at altitude. <clears throat> we, that's when we lost the engine up high. And this was a destination. This was where we were trying to go. Well, mm-hmm. we could, our, our decision was, hey, the ceiling's too low. We made the wrong decision in saying, well, we'll just go in and do the mm-hmm. circle of the land because it's like an alpha approach, right? Mm-hmm. We'll circle the land. We can get in single engine. There's there's no issue with that. What mm-hmm. we didn't, you, you need to have really good weather right, to do that. Mm-hmm. You need to be able to see. <clears throat> we couldn't. We didn't have that. Um, what you would have done is made the decision then to say, "Nope, we're not go- even going to go into this valley uh, if the weather's bad, whether you have and two engines or not." Sure. We're just not going in there because we can't climb out on one, right. and if the weather's bad, you can't see. It's not going to work. Mm-hmm. If you could see, yeah, you could spiral and sure. just visually climb. But you can't do that if you're IMC, uh, which we proved very successfully. Okay. 
And also in your scenario, they lowered the ceiling into your plane. So we well, wouldn't have punched in. Right. But that wasn't the point, you know. Right, right. The point was to consider it ahead of time. Yes. Hey, worst case, we have to climb out of here. All right, what what performance will we need in our best case scenario? We can't do that. We can't go here. Right. At Penguin, we have uh, runway data that will include a single engine procedure in the case of a mist in places like this. Now, this is a probably wouldn't be a place that our aircraft would be landing, but. Uh, no. <laughs> Uh, if it were the scenario where you needed a different single engine escape maneuver, it would be listed on our landing data. But all right, let me continue with this. The bottom line is that the scenario is something that needs to be considered well in advance. I agree a hundred percent. You need an escape route. If you go miss somewhere after the missed approach point, you have to pay particular attention when there is a non-standard climb gradient on the missed procedure. If there are funky turns or minimum altitudes to follow or anything else that suggests that there are obstacles around that affect the missed approach procedure, i.e. your ability to stay away from terrain, as suggested by the safety leader on our approach type club. This, oh, did I say that right? As, I think they meant safety. Yeah, the aircraft safety leader type. of our aircraft type club. The one thing that I could have done differently is to co coordinate with the controller in advance that in the event of a rejected landing, I was going to fly the obstacle procedure and then preloaded the FMS for that possibility. Food for thought regards, Sierra Echo. Um, that is a good way to close that up. I think it's ahead of time. You could coordinate some of those obstacles, uh, other airplanes with ATC. Hey, uh, if I have to go missed out of this for some reason, I need 9,000. I want to do the ODP. Now, just as a sidebar, ODPs are designed to account for airplanes getting to an altitude and then going in any direction and safely navigate with a normal climb gradient after that. So the 9,000 could be conservative for maybe going in directions towards the higher terrain, whereas this missed approach was likely taking you away from it or on a lower side of it, or you could stop at 6,600 feet. So big picture, something to think about. But um, I do agree with your philosophy to have that programmed as a possibility. But even bigger picture than that is for every pilot that's listening to this, if you're going somewhere specifically at night or in low lower IFR where you cannot maintain VFR and missed approach and stay away from this terrain, you need to evaluate your missed approach procedure from the standpoint of a departure. What if I got below this? How would I, can I perform if I lost an engine? If you're on a twin engine, this is a jet and it's powerful and maybe light and you're able to maintain all these required climb gradients but if if you're on an airplane that's performance um it, it needs to be enhanced you wish it had a, a, another engine <laughs> <laughs> then this is something to consider hey i can't do this i'm committed if i touch down unless i brief this obstacle departure procedure when i touch down i'm i'm committed to that and if i can't for some reason like in your case just sliding down the runway surely you're not going to continue you're going to try to get out of it this is how I'm going to get out of it is do I have this program? If I brief this, do I have something to follow to get me out of here? What are your thoughts? So the aspect of knowing that Sierra echo, knowing that his aircraft is capable of getting back to the safe side of the missed approach, you know, quickly it is super critical in making that decision. Mm -hmm. I know I can get back there. If you're in a plane that maybe a single engine that could do this, okay, that, that's capable of doing that, but it's just barely. Like, you're going to have to fly this thing perfectly, right, to be on the right side of the mm -hmm. margin. Mm -hmm. Nope. Nope. There's no room for mm -hmm. a delay, for an error in some mistake that you made. There's no buffer built in. You're flying right to the right to the edge of that. And so I I think the decision in in that case is we're just not going in here in bad weather. Uh so yeah, it's got to be Dave VMC for me to be able to to stay away from granite. Otherwise, hey, we're going to delay this or wait till the morning, something like that, but I mean, it sounds like you did everything right ahead of time. You looked ahead, you saw the, the webcams, the runway was clear. The report said the runway was uh, 
safe to land on and poof here you go sliding down the runway yep um, this is the scenario of we're short final and a deer goes mm-hmm. running across yep okay we're going around and it's low ceilings like you're not going to circle right you're punching nope. back in that's what's happening yes so it's not completely inconceivable that you would find yourself in this situation this is advanced I would say the yes. scenario is if you're going into a place like this where a missed approach could put you near terrain, these are the type of things that you need to be considering ahead of time. Yeah. And if you're not, you you need to think about what you're doing. Yeah. The old adage, you can always go around is true, but not every go around is the same. Right. And you don't want to be asking the question of how high can I go here straight out runway heading towards this mountain? Not knowing that, hey, there's a departure procedure for here, and I don't have any ATC to talk to. So kudos to you for the awareness to know. I don't have. There's no get out of jail free on this. I can't call ATC and and get a vector. I'm in my own airplane, flying my own path here. I choose what happens. Did we get to all that? I think so. This is this is a good one. Thank you, Sierra Echo, for <laughs> sending this. When I first saw it, I said. Ugh. I don't know. It kind of, I get it. I totally get what happened. It's just, this is very nuanced. Mm -hmm. My wife loves that word. That was for you. Okay. (laughs) Anything to add in closing? If, If there's something, if there's something we missed on this and you heard it and, or you have similar experience and you can share your alternative to this instead of an ODP or the missed approach at a different altitude, whatever, whatever your solution is, if you have one, send it to us. You good? Mm-hmm. All right. All right. Moving on. Feedback time. Feedback. I think it's your turn. Is it my turn? <laughs> <laughs> Number one from patron Delta Delta Charlie. Hi, AG and R H in regards to saying sharp and GA, a couple of items get talked about regularly in my area. One thing to do is to have a mission that keeps you flying regularly. A common example is flying for the EAA Young Eagles program, but I know there are several animal rescue and angel flight programs as well. As long as you find it fun and or rewarding, it'll keep you from stagnating. Good idea. I like that. Uh, it was brought other... to our attention that Angel Flight has a minimum hour requirement. I don't want to say it because it might be wrong. Um, but the animal rescue may not have uh, as high of limitations. So mm-hmm. if you have room for you know, a small animal cage or a way to get it into your cargo bin, that could be a good way because the minimums might allow a newer pilot to fly pets or animals around. All right. Sorry. Good. The other thing is to become part of the local aviation community. That can range from a local IMC club, EAA chapter, or going to the local FBO and asking what the airport has going on. That gives you a huge range. From There's always old guys sitting around at the FBO Mm -hmm. drinking coffee and eating the cookies (laughs) that they got for canceling that you didn't get. (laughs) That gives you a huge range from professional presentations on safety to very informal hangar sessions. Or you can have uh, one of your aviation buddies double-check your next flight plan or brainstorming on any of the thousands of questions that can come up. That is true. Just get it. Just go go to the airport. Mm -hmm. I was driving one time north of here and drove right by one of our satellites. And I said, huh, I didn't know that was right there. Mm -hmm. I had some time. I just stopped. I drove in. I sat and talked to the old guys in the FBO for... It could have gone on for hours. Cool. Yeah. So I was there for probably 30 minutes and we just, and chit chatted about, you know, ATC stuff and flying stuff. And did you tell them you were a controller? Yeah. Yeah. Were they ATC users or they were afraid of us? No, they were, they were, they were users. One was a twin, uh, a twin IFR guy. And I don't remember the other guy, but. Uh, yeah. Um, that's how I just said, Hey, I, I'm a controller. 
from the triad and I was driving by and saw the airport and just thought I would stop by and see what mm-hmm. was going on. Cool. Yeah. So anyway, go do that. Just go talk to people. You'll find Thank- out a lot of things. <clears throat> Thank you, Delta Delta Charlie. Good suggestions. All right, number two from patron Whiskey Charlie Lima. Hi, yes, I'm one of your patrons. Flying IFR, you're going to be talking to someone, but flying VFR out of an un... I think you meant towered airport. Your phone changed it to unpowered. <laughs> <laughs> flying VFR out of an unpowered airport. How do you find the right approach frequency to request flight following? Great question. Uh... On your sectional chart or zoomed in on your EFB, you should see a departure frequency or approach frequency listed for a nearby Charlie. That would be the easiest way to find it. Well, they're asking if you continue on. Oh, Uh, I have the local frequencies memorized. I'm sorry, but there's a place to look when other than the boxes on the VFR chart. If you don't know the local frequency, do you just call a random Tracon frequency you happen to remember and ask them for the right one? If it matters, I fly... And SoCal, <laughs> the SoCal Tracon has a whole lot of sectors. Thanks. Whiskey Charlie Lima, instrument student. Uh, down there, that, that could be an issue because if you pick the wrong one and they don't know where you're at or the landmarks, because not everybody's certified on every scope there. That's an area-driven uh, type of certification, I believe, in that Tracon. Is that true? Mm-hmm. They don't. Everybody doesn't know everything. Um, I think that's right. So... Here's a way to do it. Have we said? I think we've said this. On if you're not your your VFR, your EFB should have access to. I think even the free versions have access to approach plates, right? Well, they're an instrument student, so. Oh, okay. Yep. Duh. Uh, on the approach plate, it'll show the CTAP frequency. It'll it should show the approach frequency, the one that is utilized in that area. And if you are on the wrong one of the two that are offered the person that you do get on the radio should know the right one. So check out the approach plate for your airport that you're leaving. And there should be an approach frequency on there or center frequency. If which in this case is not, this is just for everybody. Center's not running airspace down to the surface. Generally speaking in this area, it's, it's driven by SoCal Tracon. So, yeah, I just randomly pulled one up in that okay. area mm-hmm. and yep. Unicom. It's got the AWOS, the Unicom, and the approach control Mm -hmm. on the approach plate. So I think that's a great... Yeah, and if you're curious, look at maybe an airport 10 or 15 miles away. It could be a different frequency because they are heavily sectorized because of the volume out there. In that, And there's a lot of VFR traffic too, so... You have a funny look on your face. What am I missing? Something happened to my browser. I don't know what happened. (laughs) It's done something weird. Oh, Uh -oh. I see. I see what it is. I fixed it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Whiskey Charlie Lima. Good luck on your instrument training. Keep us posted. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure you're going to have those frequencies memorized um, locally, but maybe when you're looking for a place to depart VFR and find that frequency, that's maybe the point of your question. It should be on the approach plate. All right. You want number three? Number three from patron Sierra Golf. <laughs> Hello, Sky Gods. A random piece of feedback from listening to the back catalog in bulk. Mm. I really appreciate how ATC lingo pops up in your language off radio. My two favorites on the show are RH's frequent standby while pulling up something to show in the live stream video and AG's send us feedback reference episode <laughs> XYZ. I don't even realize I'm doing that. I aspire to incorporate these into my everyday language. Uh, I, f- I fully support that. Mm-hmm. I use Roger way too often, way too much for just <laughs> everything. And I f- like a Chick-fil-A. Yeah. Roger that. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, pretty terrible. I'm an, I'm a dork like that. Uh, a related story, I used to occasionally commute by train underneath the Sourdough Bravo, and if I was lucky, my non-pilot wife would pick me up at the station and save me a 20-minute walk home in the rain. Uh, nice. That's nice. Uh, one day, <laughs> after she'd been practicing her radio calls in the right seat and asking about ATC instructions, a common instruction 
on the right base into database delta is report the cement plant. She texted me, report Menlo, two stops before my stop. <laughs> I've never been so proud. <laughs> Your loyal flight follower, patron Sierra Gulf. I love it. So wait, that means she was riding along in your airplanes enough to know the report phraseology. Oh, that is... And then she applied that to your train ride. Yeah, and it's so much more succinct. Instead of your wife saying, tell me when you get to the Menlo stop, report report Menlo. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) Uh, Perfect. Thank you, Sierra Golf. Mm -hmm. My turn. Yes. From Patreon, Mike Kilo. I think you guys will have fun with this one. Flying from Taco Truck Airport to the Green Pit pickup flight following from Duke. Hand it off to Seymour Base. <laughs> Seymour. Spelled C S E E space M O R E. <clears throat> Traffic one to two o'clock, five miles, five hundred feet above. All right. Now what's a pilot doing when they hear that? Just look at us. Like what what are you doing when you hear that call? I'm, I go straight to the fish finder, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, I look at outside. Yeah. I go, okay, I go <clears throat> two o'clock. Mm-hmm. I try to guess five miles, which is impossible. Impossible. And slightly above. Yeah. All right. Which is also very difficult. 500 feet is nothing. Right. It is if nothing. you pass a plane at 500 feet opposite direction and you're both going like 100 or more knots... <laughs> It looks like you're colliding. Yes. Yeah. All right. So Seymour said traffic one to two o'clock, five miles, 500, 500 feet above. And Mike Kilo said, looking, negative contact. Seymour, do you have the mighty ADSB? Me. Affirmative. <laughs> we never reported visual contact and they continued to call them out until no longer a factor. But there was definitely a different conversation between us. We were the first to report that traffic appeared to be turning away behind us. Happened twice on two different trips. And no, I most assuredly did not say (laughs) I got him on the fish finder, although I was tempted. (laughs) Mike Kilo. This is funny. This just came up recently on a flight. I'm with a new crew going Mm -hmm. across the pond. Mm -hmm. And one of them is involved in GA and asked me about the responses for a traffic call from ATC. It seems to be a debate that I don't remember ever having really being upset about it from a controller perspective. Like we've heard a million things. We've heard got him on the fish finder, which probably places you on the, that's the wrong answer. (laughs) But I didn't mind if someone said insight, looking, not insight, Roger. I just want an acknowledgement that you heard me. Yeah. And we did a whole series on this. I think we did several episodes where we talked about traffic calls. We have to, as controllers, if you are going to merge with another airplane or be in the vicinity of one, we kind of take it to the extreme and and try it, I believe. I think we give way too many traffic calls, but you're nodding your head in the affirmative. Yes. The book requires us to issue traffic to merging targets that are not separated by more than the required separation minima. Right? Yes. So a thousand feet apart, two IFRs are at the approach minima or the separation minimum. They're not above that. So we're supposed to say traffic 12 o'clock, three miles, opposite direction, citation, 7,000. If you're at six, I don't care if you see them. I don't need to know. Right. I have to tell you that. And in case you were thinking, huh, I wonder if air traffic sees this guy aimed right at us. Now, you know, we did because we just gave you a traffic call. Right. It'll probably be followed up by a traffic call to the other airplane that's aimed towards you a thousand feet above you with the same type of traffic call. 12 o'clock, three miles up direction, six thousands, a bonanza, whatever. Yeah. We have to do that. It has to you, be done. You don't ever have to see them. No. It doesn't matter. If I'm going to have you follow somebody, it's an important detail. Hey, traffic to follow. Two o'clock, three miles on five mile final for two, three left. Airbus, insight, maintain visual separation, caution like turbulence, clear visual approach, contact tower, boom, done. All right. <laughs> but that's an, an exchange of information that was necessary. A random in route traffic call does not ever require you to see them. And even if you, 
there's no cookies for that. If you say I see them, great. If you never see them, also doesn't matter. I'm just letting you know that I'm doing my job. Right. And if it does matter, you're, the controller is not doing their job. <laughs> yeah. It, it should not be like this. Traffic 12 o'clock, same altitude, opposite direction. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't see them, you'll probably hit. That is not <laughs> right. how it works. <laughs> I should be doing something prior to that to make sure that you don't hit. Uh, traffic calls are you are sometimes made to give you a reason of why you're stuck at an altitude. You're a climbing jet or a climbing prop, and you're stuck at a lower altitude. All right, now I know why I'm stuck down here. I'm waiting for this traffic to pass. They get it. I don't know why the controller asked if you saw him on your ADSB, because even if you said no, it doesn't change the scenario, right? No, nothing changes. It's just oh my gosh, just, you don't see him. Turn, turn now. <laughs> ADSB is a display of ADSB in traffic. That is the the modern day version of a fish finder, if you will. I will. So the controller asking you if you saw them on that. I don't know. Maybe they were bored and they want you to know that. Hey, there's. I see the other plane out there. If if you see them, I didn't have to give you a traffic call, but I did because I don't want you to think I didn't see them. Is that what's happening? Maybe. I don't know. Okay. I don't understand the point of that question. It's it's silly. There's no point to it. <laughs> Never ask it again. Oh, you haven't been saying. Oh, on your ADSB? In that oh. case, descend and maintain. Roger, maintain <laughs> ADSB separation. <laughs> right, because that's a thing. Right. Come on. Not a thing. <laughs> All right. Uh, who read that one? Me? I did. Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you, Mike Kilo. That sat in there for a little bit. Thank you for that exchange. It got me on a little mini soapbox about traffic calls, but... I don't know what the book says. I'm too lazy to look. I think as a pilot, you can say a number of things. As long as we know you heard us and don't say fish finder there. <laughs> yep. All right. You get number five. Uh, number We're five. We're doing great on time. Are we? Yeah. All right. Number five from patron, the Badger pilot. Gentlemen, I've attached a flight plan question that I... Don't think it's come up before. Can a flight plan include radar vectors in the middle? One solution I didn't mention in the audio was flying VFR until I'm past the Bravo, then picking up my clearance airborne, but weather would limit that option. And at the at that point, I'd probably just go VFR the whole way. Thanks as always for the great show and congrats on your recent personal accomplishments. See ya, Badger. All right. I am ready to play this audio. One, one, two, three, boop. Hey guys, it's the Badger Pilot flying around the Badger State and based just a few miles from the Badger VOR with a question about routing, Bravo Airspace, and Victor Airways. If somebody were to be flying a slant alpha aircraft, so no GPS, only a VOR or maybe two VORs to navigate, and wanted to go around the Windy City Bravo from north to south, how would they go about doing that? In OB314, you mentioned that if you're planning IFR in the area of a Bravo, you should probably do your best to avoid the Bravo altogether and go around. And as I look at the Windy City Bravo, there are a few Victor Airways that cut right through the heart of it, but it's no secret that the Windy City Bravo does not accommodate overflights. So that leaves going over a big lake to the east or pretty much going out to Iowa to the west. I could, of course, also fly just VOR to VOR, but that, of course, doesn't necessarily guarantee obstacle and terrain obstruction or radio reception. So my question is this. Is there a way to file an IFR flight plan for a slant alpha aircraft that starts on a Victor airway, includes radar vectors in the middle to eventually join a completely different Victor airway on the other side of a Bravo? Truthfully, I'd be pretty surprised if such a thing existed, but I figured I would ask just in case. In the meantime, I'm currently content flying a slant India plane. At least I think that's what it is. I can tune a VOR and fly airways, but I can also tune in a known waypoint based on the radial and DME distance, which hopefully would shave off a few flying miles. Thanks for all your help, guys. See ya. Huh. That's a really good question. That is a good question. I think you're right on slant India. We used, that's what we used to have in mm -hmm. uh, 
one version of the helicopter, and that's what we always filed. Because we could go to points as long as they were somehow definable by a radial DME off of a a ground-based navigation thing. Anyway, okay. Um, I don't... I am not aware of any provision that allows you to file this way. You could definitely get from air traffic and expect, you mm-hmm. know, uh, clear direct XYZ, join Victor 227, depart such and such VOR heading 090 to join Victor whatever, expect further clearance from, you know, Windy City approach. I, I don't know. I could see air traffic saying something like that. We do that at Triad all the time. We give planes to Duke, direct to a fix, depart the fix, heading 095, further clearance from Duke approach. We do that. We do that. Uh, But that can't can't be codified in a flight plan. You would just have to say uh, a fix on the airway, direct to a fix on the airway. Yep. Like the other one, you want to jump the tracks. Right. And somebody has to know on the way. Hmm. I can't go direct. Yeah. See, I don't that's think there's problem. nobody. Look, somebody get, the, the lawyers are going to get mad for me saying this. I don't think there's a clearinghouse for somebody vetting this flight plan. If you did file that way, say you filed from Badger to Vector fixes, Badger to Vector to destination. And uh, there was no way for your airplane to legally navigate between the two unless you told ATC, hey, I can do this, but it would help if I got a heading until I can get on this airway. Once you're established and talking to them, they should they could they could do that. Yeah. The whole Nordo, what if I lost my radio and now I don't have a way to do it? You probably shouldn't be filing something that you can't actually do. I think that's fair. Mm-hmm. But if your plane can actually legally navigate between those two fixes, I agree with you. There's you can file those two fixes, jump the tracks that way. Yeah. If you can define a point as a slant India, because typically it, if you're choosing something that's on the Victor airway, it's definable. It has mm-hmm. a DME from yep. a VOR mm-hmm. and a radial. And you can put that in. You should be able to file it that way. And Arch is right. There's nobody, when you file that, that goes, hey, you're a slant India. You can't do this. this or you're a impossible. slant alpha. Yeah. You can't file like this. Mm-mm. No one's doing that. And most, I don't, I'm not disparaging the average controller, the slant, whatever, a lot of them now don't know the differences. No. And they they all assume, I think, at some level, you have something that's giving you the they, ability to navigate, which you can go direct. Yeah, right. And c- case in point, just file slant alpha and go out and fly in the NAS. Yeah, they'll they're let you fly give, direct somewhere all day. They're going to give you direct all day long. I, yes. I will put this out there as a disclaimer. If this, if your airplane isn't certified with some sort of installed GPS, yes. this is strictly not legal. <laughs> supposed to be doing that, no. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying the controllers won't necessarily notice if it's happening. So answer your question. No, there's. I don't think there's a way for you to file these random requests for radar vectors. File a way that does keep you on a flight plan that will be approved. And in the worst case, Nordo, guess what? That's what you're flying. You're flying all the way to this point out in Iowa, like you mentioned, because you know, nobody wants to go swimming over Lake Michigan. So, no. Uh, good question, though. Yeah, I like it. And oh, what's I, the update on this one? Yeah, it was the he. Uh, he did get this. He did. I'm end gonna up read it. I'm buying read this it. plane. I'm gonna read it right out. But of I the don't text. remember there being a thing about the plane in the feedback. Uh, was there? Did I miss uh, that? Mm, I wasn't. Uh, An update. The Badger pilot, he was able to purchase the airplane he mentioned. Well, cool. Very good. Now, because you're in aviation and you have your own airplane, this is the next step in the evolution of airplane ownership. You have to rip out the whole console. Yep. And replace all the avionics. Yes. Also, your kids are no longer going to college. They're not. And you are mortgaging (laughs) your house. (laughs) Again. Again, the, the equity in your home is now in the panel in your plane. <laughs> you you will be slant golf, and dang it, you will take your family up at least once. Yes. 
Uh, You're laughing because it's true. It is true. It's very true. Yep. That's why I have refrained from buying a plane. Am I getting the last one here? Yes, this is fun. This one is fun. All right. From Patron Mike Sierra. Good evening. Patron Mike Sierra here while faring a Grand Caravan. Is that a 208? It is. From the Triad region to New Mexico last weekend, I decided to jump on the We Love ATC bandwagon just to see what would happen. One of the results is attached in audio. Thanks for all you do. I've learned a ton from listening to your podcast. Mike Sierra. I'm ready to hit play. I am. Hold on. Actually, I'm not. I'm looking at these buttons, and they look very similar. Oh, because you put the show title at the beginning. <laughs> like, I have them on the soundboard. All right. I love ATC. I'm ready to hit it. One, two, three. Boop. Approach. Good afternoon. Four five eight three three one zero thousand. Four five eight three three approach. All centers three zero zero seven. Three zero zero seven. Four five eight three three. Four five eight three three. My coworker here would like to know if you listen to the Opposing Faces podcast. Exactly where we got it from. <laughs> I think I know who said that to you in that room. Actually, if it was really? out in New Mexico, yes. Oh, if it if it was all the way out that far, so if it was that far, right? Yes. Um, or if if they left to try it, it could have been somebody here at work. Could have been. I didn't recognize that voice. Did you? No. Okay. I cool. Didn't <laughs> Thanks for sharing the audio. <laughs> How would, how, did it sound like they grabbed that from liveatc.net or was that recorded inside the plane, you think? That sounded like liveatc to me. Okay. But I don't know. I don't know. Oh, very cool. Uh, your results may vary. We have another feedback in the inbox. I'm going to give a preview. Somebody tried the penguin iceberg response. Uh, oh. Sh- shout out and response. What do we call that? Uh, uh, challenge and response. Challenge and response. Yeah. Duh. Hey, I'm. <laughs> Suffering from some sleep issues lately. <laughs> My brain is not quite caught up. Which, it's by okay. the way, I figured yeah. I had to sleep in another country six time zones away. You just have to skip a day of sleeping. Deprive yourself of sleep and you yes. will And then sleep. that second night, I promise you. You will sleep like a baby. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wake up every two hours screaming, wanting to be fed. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> Thank you, Mike Sierra, for sending the audio. If you want to send audio to the show, you can go to our website, opposingbases.com. There's a button uh, for SpeakPipe. It'll let you send a 90-second audio. If that's not enough time, you can record one on your phone and send us an MP3 file. We can play it on the show. Yeah, shorter uh, shorter clips are better because after, like, <clears throat> I mean, 90 seconds is even pushing my uh, ability to focus on something. <laughs> Hey, shout out to the feedbacks on this one. You got a lot of different feedbacks in here, but they're all relatively shorter. So it gives us time to comment and get the, you get your point out. Yeah. We're able to discuss a little bit and not be constrained with, you know, some of the longer ones. So great job on these feedbacks. These are all of yeah. adequate size. And these are all patron. You guys are crushing yeah. it. The patrons are crushing it. They're making the show. All right, we have feedback prior to January 11th, 2024, right on the show, or we'll respond to via email if we missed yours. Scream really loud and throw your computer out the window. We'll try to get it on another show. I feel like under my helm, <clears throat> we are getting farther and farther behind. That's not your fault. I, I need to... <sighs> we're generating more f- questions and responses from I'm the doing that on topics. purpose, and maybe I should stop doing it. Yeah. <laughs> We have to space out the request for more information sometimes. Yes. All right. Uh, Maybe we'll go on a a small break. (laughs) But you're crushing it. Your notes are fantastic. Thank you. Okay. All right. Anything to add? No. Closing out episode 322 of Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk. Romeo Hotel. And Alpha Golf. Goodbye, everyone. Visit OpposingBases.com where you can send a written or audio question to be included on a show. Find AG and RH on Instagram at Opposing Bases. Send your questions to feedback at OpposingBases.com. For access to live stream video recordings, bonus audio, early recordings, and discounts on show merchandise, visit Patreon.com slash Opposing Bases to join an awesome aviation community. The views and opinions expressed on Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk are for entertainment purposes only and do not represent the views, opinions, 
or official positions of the FAA, Penguin Airlines, or the United States Army. Episodes shall not be recorded or transcribed without express written consent. For official guidance on laws, rules, and regulations, consult an aviation attorney or a certified flight instructor. Drop.